Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kathleen Shannon Dorsey, and I'd like to invite everyone to um, find a seat. We are about to celebrate the official 30-year celebration of UW-Tacoma and who we are together. This is a moment of community and a very sacred time for all of us, um, all of you who have participated in recording and uh, will speak live. It is a contribution that's going to last over time. Our people in our IT people are making a video that are going to be able to share with grandpas and grandmas and everybody across the country. <laughs> so we're very, very thankful for that. I, I'd like to invite Declan Spencer, who is a current um, student here in our uh, healthcare leadership program and a member of the Puyallup tribe. He's going to be speaking and giving us the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Declan. Ash Lachel, Twe Gwalapu, Gwalapu the Ishad, Disiaya Declan Tidsta, Spoyala Pabs Chad, to all Chad Poyala, Kenneth Tista, Eti Bad, Miranda Tista, Eti Skoy, Isla Tista, Eti Kaya, Lorita Jane Williams, Tista, Eti Kaya, Frank Wright Sr. Tista etid stapa. Good day to all of you. All of you are my beloved people, my relations. My name is Declan. I am a Puyallup tribal member, and I am from Puyallup. My father's name is Kenneth Spencer, and my mother's name is Miranda Banner. My grandmother's name is Isla Wright. My great grandmother's name is Larita Jane Williams, and my great grandfather's name is Frank Wright Sr. In our Lushut seed language, we are known as the Pach. The literal translation of this word means people from the bend at the mouth of the river. This refers to the many dispersed villages that, that spawned outward from the mouth of the Puyallup River near the present day site of the Tacoma Dome. The Pach also became associated with our people's welcoming and generous behavior. Over time, the meaning of Pach or Puyallup has taken on this association. We are one of many Lushootseed speaking peoples of the Northwest. Prior to European settlement, our people lived in villages from the foothills of Mount Rainier and along the rivers, creeks, and prairies of Western Washington, all the way to the, the shores of the Puget Sound. That said, on December 24th, 1854, our Puyallup people, along with the neighboring tribes and bands, were invited by the representatives of the US government to participate in a potlash at the Medicine Creek. Today, it is known as McAllister Creek, named after a white pioneer who settled the area. To our ancestors' surprise, they were met with official documents asking them to sign away their lands. After three days of poorly communicated negotiation, a few of the uh, tribal representatives, not speaking or writing English, signed their X's or signatures on the Medicine Creek Treaty. To this day, it is believed that many of the, those X's or signatures were forged. With this, three reservations were created. One at Puyallup, one at Nisqually, and one on Squaxin Island. Not only were the original reservations too small to comfortably fit all of our people, but they were also poorly located, away from the natural resources that provided us our natural medications and natural foods. As a result of this, miscommunication and an abuse of power, our people went to war. The Treaty Wars, commonly referred to as the Indian Wars, took place between 1855 and 1856. During these wars, many battles took place from the South Sound to Seattle and even into the Yakima Territory. While each tribe had their own experiences, their motivations for fighting were all the same. Our people were being pushed out, abused, and even murdered at the hands of the new settlers. During these times, many of the Washington Territory tribes came together in solidarity. Over the past 160 years, the Puyallup tribe has become a recognizable force in the fight for the tribal rights. Our elders valiantly fought for tribal fishing rights, my great-grandfather being one of them. This eventually led to the Bolt decision in 1974, which was and is still monumental. The Bolt decision gave us back our rights to fish on our ancestral lands we have also became a political force, particularly since the 1990 land claims settlement 
between the tribe, local governments, Washington State, and the United States government. With that said, we the Puyallup people and our relatives have come a long way, and our journey continues to this day. The fact that I am standing here before you is an achievement on its own, and my goal as a Puyallup tribal member and a student of the University of Washington Tacoma School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership is to make sure that I can provide for generations to come. One of the main projects that I'm a part of within the Puyallup tribe to make sure that this trend continues is a current and slow developing at-risk program or at-risk youth program as some would call it. But I like to call it thanks to the help of our very own Dr. Christine Stevens, the Youth with Promise program. This program is being built to put pillars in place um, to make sure that all Puyallup tribal youth can be successful in adulthood. This will allow us to make sure that no youth feel that they are unheard, they feel unsafe, or that they are left behind. Now, it is my honor on behalf of the Puyallup tribe, my ancestors, and relatives to read, acknowledge, and accept this acknowledgement of the land that was wrote by the University of Washington Tacoma's Office of Equity and Inclusion. We recognize that all of us at the University of Washington Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the ancestral homeland of the Coast, the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on the traditional territory of the Swa Twi Twad Eti Spoyalapaj, or the land of the Puyallup people. As people on this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial and all of our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as we continue to work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. Thank you for inviting me today and take care of yourselves. Thank you, Declan, for those really powerful words that remind us what it is that we are about as people coming into equity and understanding of really crimes we have committed against one another in the past and how we can stand together and bring forward opportunities for our children and to protect our land. One of the things uh, I have learned this year was from um, that Robin Kimmerer who speaks to us about how, how do we have the ability to stand in gratitude and give in reciprocity so that we grow with what we have and we don't just hold on to everything. We learn to hold in, in collaboration. So we thank you and we thank you for your words that call us to accountability. Thank you, Declan. I'd like to now introduce someone who is not a stranger to any of us, Dr. Sharon Fott, who has a history in critical care, teaching at the, the big house in Seattle, the, um, the University of Washington Montlake Branch, as it's called by some of us. <laughs> she was teaching there and was tapped to come establish this lovely little campus here. She's got a history of working in critical care, worked in the Army, has a very big heart and a very willing spirit. I'd like to invite Dr. Sharon Fott to come and tell us a few words about our creation as a campus and as a school of healthcare, nursing and healthcare leadership. Thank you. So I'm going to help us take a trip down memory lane in about four minutes to help you appreciate where we've been and where it is that we might be going. We're actually very glad to see all of you who are here, as well as those of you who are watching this virtually or will watch it on tape. Now, as you all know, those of you who have been students once upon a time, continuing your education is a very big deal, a really major undertaking in terms of time, commitment, and funding, too. We are here to celebrate 30 years of that by nurses and healthcare leaders. 
We're also here to celebrate the faculty, staff, UW officials, and wise legislators who had the determination and the creativity to make this UW Tacoma happen. So let me take you back just a little bit, and some of you will actually remember these beginnings. <clears throat> some of you besides me. So not so long ago, there was no degree for those planning to be healthcare leaders in our region. And the path for RNs who wanted a BS in or be beyond that uh, was not very efficient. Nurses had to go back and take all, every one of their nursing courses all over again in a baccalaureate program in order to earn their degree. The School of Nursing at UW and Sandy Ears, Kathy Barnard, and Dean Sue Hedgeveri in particular gave great support to finding a new path, a new curriculum to a BSN. And the Safeco Insurance Company actually underwrote this initiative, so we had support to try it out. In the early 90s, and, and actually back a bit further into the late 80s, live classes were videotaped, and then TAs drove the videotape, remember old VCR videotapes or Betamaxes, drove them to the peninsula north of Bothell and TCC, where TAs played the videotape to groups of students and facilitated conversation around course topics. My live class in Seattle was one of those odd classes that was actually taped and driven to these locations. You know, I thought it was a great idea, and I was not real wild about being taped, but I did want to see if it worked or not. I honestly had my doubts about it. So I snuck down to Tacoma one day, entered the back of the room after class had started, watched the TA start the tape, and then she would stop it and facilitate discussions. And I was on the tape, and I was asking my live class in Seattle questions. And much to my horror and surprise, the students were talking back to me on TV. Now this was like 30 years before Zoom, and people were already talking back to the TV. The TA did a great job of this. Little did she know, Dr. Liz Bridges, now at UW Medical Center, that this was really the wave of the future in so many things. It not only worked, but students absolutely stayed in the program. With a lot of community support, the state legislature approved funding to start UW campuses both in Bothell and Tacoma, and we were on our way. In June of 92, we moved into temporary facilities down on 11th and A Street. Some of you all will know where that is. Now, there were bonuses to being in old rental facilities that used to be office space. We had open, screenless windows, for example, so that the hot air could escape in the wintertime and we could get cool breezes in the, summing, in the summertime. And yes, we had a bonus, an extra bonus. Pigeons would fly in to visit whenever they wanted to during class time. And they weren't even enrolled. The first summer's faculty saw Kathleen Shannon Dorsey uh, welcome students with me here on the, the campus at 11th and A, and Karen Landeberger and Janet Promomo joined us in autumn. We crafted articulation agreements so that students at each associate degree program in our region down here would have a guarantee that all their nursing courses would transfer in, and that they would not have to be tested, and they would not have to repeat courses. In the 90s, we also plotted an MN program responding to the community and our grads' needs. We taught electives with our colleagues in what was then liberal studies as well as education. And Christine Stevens was actually among the first to support our transmission of courses beamed live to other places in Washington State. We offered electives in Tacoma and they were televised live. Uh, via two-way live TV to Bothell and to Seattle. Yes, the pigeons visited during those sessions, and during class breaks, students could visit with their friends and colleagues on the other campuses, too. We were growing, and we needed our permanent facility. We were really blessed with having Tacoma and Pierce County and the South Sound support our growth and development. Not all colleges get that advantage when they're growing and developing. We toured these buildings that you're sitting in now, and this was an old garage. These were all old warehouses. They're now the core of campus, but at that time we toured them with boots and hard hats. And we climbed ladders up three stories inside the buildings, and it was hard to imagine at that time that these would be computer labs, art studios, offices, and classrooms. Around that time, the campus building 
were used as warehouses. And the biggest thing that was stored here was a huge stock of Shihuly's art glass. We haven't seen that in a long time, but at the time it was quite impressive. It was an interesting time building a campus, dodging wildlife, and being welcomed by Tacoma and Pierce County. We team taught electives for all majors on campus and surprised, I think, some of our colleagues with just what nursing and healthcare was and could do. Uh, I'll tell you those stories privately. Faculty created a culture of community-based projects and partnerships linked to courses, and many of these projects were then institutionalized by partner organizations following the end of the student's rotation. Among our first was a survey focusing on hygiene at the Thursday market down at about, oh, 9th and A Street, and its wonderful food stalls that we all absolutely enjoyed. This tradition of partnering with the health department, healthcare organizations, and the community continues to this day. We eventually moved to our permanent site here. All the ladders and hard hats were gone for the time being, and then into the Cherry Parks building, even as we continued to plan and plot new programs and study options. The 2000s saw graduate study options grow, and courses and emphasis in leadership, population health, education, and case management developed. Faculty research and scholarship grew in depth and range, with many benefits both for the faculty and students through publications, conference presentations, and financial support for this sort of work. During this time, we responded to an unusual request to support the development of an R and BSN program in another part of the state. And this was out on the peninsula where it was very difficult for students to live north of Bremerton and come to Tacoma for class, for example, in addition to working at what was Harrison Hospital at that time. Faculty and staff from UWT worked with Olympic College Administration, Dr. Jerry Babo, who was the director at that time, and faculty on developing an R to BSN program. Over time, this morphed into an accredited program for Olympic College offered on site at Polsbo, as I recall. Another decade passed, and staff were thinking creatively and worked with faculty to construct and offer still more options for flexibility and efficiency. For example, associate degree students can now take a couple of graduate courses as a part of their undergraduate degree and have them count towards a master's. The same thing applied to students who were getting their associate degree, not yet nurses. They could come to us, take selected courses during the summertime that would count towards their bachelor's degree. So it let people proceed more efficiently and actually resulted in a cost and time savings uh, for them. In the last 10 to 12 years, faculty productivity in research, scholarship, and service have grown tremendously. Members of our community, our faculty, staff, and alums have leadership roles in the Pacific Northwest. Chinese Nurses Association and the National Public Health Association, for example. Uh, they are members, faculty members of, and lead other nursing education programs, serve on advisory committees for schools of nursing, are on community organization um, boards of directors, do research abroad in Asia and in Europe, work with the Tacoma Public Schools to entice high school students to consider health and health-related careers. They support the Mary Mahoney and the Ebony Nurses Associations to improve diversity in nursing and health care, and they lead simulation efforts nationally. They teach on site here, Africa, and in Asia. That's pretty darn good for the size of faculty that we have. Their work focuses on supporting workplace wellness, mental health in teens, and food insecurity. And we're fortunate to have strong and supportive advisory boards, preceptors, and scholarship donors. In the last couple of years, together with our sister campus in Bothell, our graduate programs have been ranked nationally number three one year and number five in another year. And we're, we're very proud that we can do that, most of all because of what it means in terms of our service to our larger community. So that's you know a three minute introduction to the past. The highlights. So we also should look forward to the future. What next? At any time, really any time at all, I know faculty and staff are happy to hear your ideas about what you see as the needs for the future. 
I, I am aware, as are the faculty and staff here, about a number of thoughts that have been running around in terms of what's next. Recent thoughts for our future include how to support more faculty research, especially that link to our community, whether the community is here in downtown Tacoma or if it is in Asia, for example. How to best offer a pre-licensure program, whether one is a healthcare provider or not when they enter the program. Creative delivery options. We've all learned a lot from COVID and Zoom, and I don't think school will ever look completely like it did before. So we've got to think creatively about what works for learners, as most of ours are working full time as well. And what graduate program is going to best serve the needs of our students? We partnered with education around an EDD program for several years, and now it's time to take a look and say, okay, what next? What's going to see our serve our needs best in this situation. We're proud of you all, especially the faculty, staff, and students, and those of you who are alums and are here to support us today. We do appreciate our clinical partners, our preceptors, and our part-time faculty and clinical faculty. Our alums teach healthcare providers. They administer and manage um, whole entire healthcare organizations and hospital systems, as well as serve at the bedside caring for uh, critically ill patients and teach teen moms and work in public health. They are situated in long-term care, educational agencies, and acute care hospitals. And we have great graduates from our healthcare leadership program who now are working within healthcare organization in informatics and strategic planning, for example. We could go on and on and talk about what it is that we have done and what it is we hope to do, which is even more important. We need, the South Sound needs more academic programs and, and to continue the links between community and our school and to develop new ones. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate, as, as I'm sure we all do, you all being here, and remember to let us know what it is you think we should be thinking about next. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And for those of you who are watching this, you won't be able to see, but there was a standing ovation for Sharon. And that represents academic leadership here, our community members, alums, faculty. So Sharon, what you have done and shared with us is deeply meaningful. Now we get to have a moment, a pause, looking at photographs that we have of, of all of us over 30 years. Some of us didn't have any white hair then. I don't know, I can't remember when that was. <laughs> We have lovely pictures of you. Some of them are a little grainy as we uh, tended not to have the best of quality photography in our own houses and what we brought. But there's some lovely photos here and we have the uh, lovely IT team who's going to play these for us.
give a hand to all those who collected the photos. <laughs> Recognizing Ginger and uh, Dr. Sharon Fott, and over the years, as you can see, life has been shared with faculty, students, celebrations of goals achieved, moments and mountains climbed, and having done that together, as Sharon reminded us in the buildings we used to be, there were birds flying in, and now look at this, we're inside a building with no birds flying around. <laughs> this is a glorious moment. Um, I'd like to um, next invite um, Jessica forward. Um, I would like everybody, though, to give Jessica a hand right now because she has done so much to make this happen today. Hello. I am so very humbled to be up here representing the current staff members of the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership, as well as the staff from the past 30 years. I sincerely hope I do an adequate job. I know Nan is out there to tell me otherwise. <laughs> Originally, the staff, the ones that conduct all of the operational side of the school, was comprised of only one staff member, Dana Madden, and a few years later, Nan West joined the team. Together, these two set the foundation for how staff worked, working hard to help students achieve their goals, with students always at the center of how everything was processed. Staff developed their skill sets through participation in conferences and earning certificates and degrees with the goal of supporting students. The current staff strive to continue that work today with which is now a staff of five plus two amazing student workers. SNCL staff are often the first people prospective students contact in the school and often even for the university. We strive to create a welcoming environment assisting students in understanding the admission process, providing campus and school resources, and ensuring as much as possible that students graduate on time. We spend countless hours every year coming up with the best year-long program plan for each cohort, researching and advocating for applicants when, when there are issues that arise, helping students through clinical clearances, and analyzing every stop staff job process in order to create an inclusive environment at all times. I'm proud to say that we thrived through the pandemic and learned to adapt to students' needs. We now have online over Zoom advising appointments, online orientations, paperless ad admission materials, and Canvas resource sites. Throughout the school's accomplishments, staff have been and will continue to be silently working behind the scenes to make the office run as smooth as possible. I would just like to take that brief moment to really acknowledge Nan West and all of her accomplishments. As, as well as the current staff, a few are not able to make it tonight, Alexa Plord and Jamie Mason and Mari Roy. Um, but Fu is over here behind the camera. As well as Jonica Hopkins and Nathan Ketzner. Thank you all for that you do. things that comes to mind when we hear um, Nathan's name is that his mother was one of our earliest graduates in our program. She's not here because she's in Vermont, go figure, but <laughs> we have family connections. Julie Peerboom's niece went through this, many brothers and sisters. We've had several generations of family, and it's such a delight to see this grace of growing across academic and professional growth. Right now we have a great um, this is like when you get to see the top best hits for the Emmys. You guys are missing the Emmys and the Seahawks right now, so. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, we appreciate you coming in spite of the adversity and Teresa's special table of people. Thank you for attending. And I believe Jeff said it is being recorded. <laughs> Not the Emmys, I believe it was the Seahawk game. So for us tonight, we have a video that our wonderful IT team put together of Dr. Karen Landenberger, Dr. June Lohnberg, Dr. Susan Johnson, Dr. Patsy Maloney, Dr. Robin Evans-Agnew, 
Dr. Marjorie Dobratz, and Dr. Kathy Tashiro, sharing their memories and bringing the grace of what it meant to be a faculty in, involved in our journey of 30 years. I will say, um, gracefully, um, Dr. June Lohenberg agreed to do Marjorie's because it was such a, a very touching story she needed to tell and she didn't think she could say it without the assistance of her dear friend, Dr. June. So, take it away, team. I came to Tacoma in 1992 for the beginning of a brand new campus uh, in Tacoma and for the start of the nursing program. It was an exhilarating time. It was so exciting. Um, I was with the initial faculty of, uh, see, Sharon Fought, Bill Page, Janet Permomo, Kathleen Shannon Dorsey, and me. And our challenge was to build um, an undergraduate RN to BSN nursing program and a graduate program. And it was such an exciting possibility to work in a new, uh, new university, building it up from the bottom with an exciting new curriculum and seeing how far we could go with it. When I first came to UW Tacoma, I was working as a public health nurse for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. And I came here to visit and attend a lecture put on by the Service Education and Research and Community Health Nursing Program uh, that were one of the principal organizers of that group was uh, Dr. Janet Promomo. And I remember being amazed at the facilities and the idea that uh, nurses could uh, work together and learn together, uh, both uh, nurses working in the community and partnering with academics. And that's been a core theme all the way along. It also transformed me as a person. I was able to work with the new program, but most importantly, I was able to work with committed, collaborative, and thoughtful faculty and students um, to build something new. When I was a PhD student and I came back to teach, I always felt a sense of coming home, of being welcomed, especially when I entered uh, the beautiful Cherry Parks building and I just have this memory of walking up this, the, the wooden staircase and just feeling like, oh, I'm at a place that, that uh, appreciates me and um, appreciates where I am on the journey and is, is very supportive um, and yet challenging also uh, because as a student and as a faculty, I've always been challenged to do my best um, and to expand my thinking and to explore new ideas. So um, I, I see the, the School of Nursing as a nurturing place, but also one that um, expects and um, helps us achieve excellence. My favorite memory at UWT is happens every day when I view LinkedIn. I see another graduate school acceptance, a publication or a national presentation. Just last week, three of our MN graduates were presenting for two different national nursing associations. I am so proud of our students and our alumni. They are our legacy. They make my moments every day. Dr. Marjorie Dobratz came up here and was our director for 10 years. During that time, students and faculty adored her and we made so much progress. I accepted the UWT position to be close to John. She did not know that at the time, but is saying that now. After he faced the cancer surgery, I know God sent me here to be close to him. After a long struggle and a compromised immune system, we lost him. In 30 years time, there is a lot of grief and loss, but also a lot of wonderful memories. One of the last conversations I had with John before he was intubated and went into the ventilator was at Overlake Hospital in Bellevue. There was a nursing instructor there with her students 
that I had taught at UWT. She so remembered the fine teaching she received there. John was so proud and called me to tell me about his conversation with you. And I think she had many, many stories like that to tell. What I would like to see is nurses becoming more vocal and more political, because a lot of the solutions to our problems, when I say political, I don't necessarily mean running for office, but I mean changing policy, you know, so that healthcare is more accessible, changing policy so there's not so much inequity um, between different groups in terms of their health status. And being aware of that, being sharp, you know. What I see next for UW Tacoma is continuing to build our bedrock of serving the community for its academic and its research and its public health and health promotion needs. So I'm very excited for more interdisciplinary work, more programs emanating from us and developing stronger, more resilient nurses, nurses who care, nurses who have compassion, and nurses who believe in the mission of the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. Thank you to all the faculty who took time to record. And I think the words of Marjorie shared by, um, I, I do think when Dr. Lonberg said there were many other people who felt the grace of what um, she brought to us, Marjorie brought also a sense of what it means to live a real life, sort of like what Ed Sheeran says to us, a heart that's been loved. <laughs> it's a, a heart that has been broke is a heart that's been loved. I think all of us who struggle with the realities of of health and inequities in the world, what Kathy calls us to think about how do we step in and make a difference, we are invited together to do that. And this is a wonderful group of people who the faculty are still inviting you to new horizons. Now I'd like to invite a special team forward, um, Vincent Daw and Dr. Christine Stevens. She keeps moving around the room, I thought you were okay. <laughs> They're going to be sharing some very important stories with us. And at, as what Kathy spoke to us about being called into leadership, Vincent Daw has been uh, this past year the ASB president. He's one of our current healthcare, well, no, he's a graduate and is employed now, excuse me. I'm way off. <laughs> Just like what Patsy said, if you looked at LinkedIn, he's probably got that all right up on, yep, score. Please welcome Christine and Vincent. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with my colleague, uh, Vincent Da. Um, we're supposed to help you remember that the Healthcare Leadership Program is part of the celebration as well. So we're going to give you a timeline, and uh, Vincent will uh, continue to um, tell you the most interesting part. Dr. Alexis Wilson and Dr. Ruth Ray were the founding um, brainstorm of the Healthcare Leadership Program. We started in 2009 with 14 students and have considered and have grown in that program. But why they started the program was that we have a very solid program in nursing with social um, justice. But what they were looking for is um, an opportunity for people in the South Sound to develop a career that would be um, one that could be fulfilling for them. And back then, as now, healthcare is the largest employer in Washington State. And so there would be many opportunities for these graduates. The other thing is, and I always tell my students there, we had a hidden agenda for this program. Now, I tell my students, when you have a hidden agenda, whether it's hidden in your syllabus, your curriculum, media, or policies, you have to look for bias and assumptions. So I'm going to be transparent with you about what was our bias and assumptions, so you don't have to guess or be graded on it. So here's the hidden agenda. Nursing program already had a very solid foundation with exquisite faculty teaching about social justice, social determinants of health, health disparities. We wanted to build on that. The second thing is, 
it does, we cannot let just nurses bear the burden of having to do social justice in the healthcare system. If you're going to change the system, you have to have discipline, interdisciplinary work. We had to infiltrate all levels of healthcare, and that was our goal. Business uh, degrees are very good, and that's what most healthcare, uh, most healthcare agencies, hospitals, public health departments have. But what we wanted was graduates that understood the healthcare system also understood health disparities, social determinants of health, inequities, how do, you work with, how do you work with the communities we serve, and how do we have team communications in, with diverse teams, but also how do we have effective leadership. Each year of the program, we would go out and talk to preceptors and alumni and students about what are the trends coming, what do you think's coming, what do you think we should do next, what do we need to put, and, because of that, our program has consistently changed. We added informatics because people said that's what we need. But we had a brilliant young professor that not only added informatics, but added how can you make sure, think about bias in the data you collected, how you collected it, and the interpretation of that data. And we all know that data can be used in different ways, and she was great about that. We have faculty here who teach health and society class and does a marvelous job about talking about health disparities, social determinants health. But we don't want you only to know at how health disparities are, what, where they are. We want you to come up with solutions, and that was what we were looking for. We also wanted um, them to have ideas about how to change the barriers to access and how to develop policies that are not anti-bias, but we wanted them to go a step further. Not only anti-bias, but we wanted anti-racist. Not, we're not gonna be racist, but anti-racist policies and looking at that. And so in all of that, that's what we've been doing with our program. Healthcare leadership program is the most diverse program on campus. Yes, there's deans out there that are now scratching their head. I have data that I will send to you. It is the most diverse. 68% of our students are first gen. We have students with immigrant stories and students from different communities, and that's the strength of our program. One of our students early on said, I was looking for a program that didn't ask me to leave my culture at the door. And that is what we seek, is that faculty, students, staff, patients, clients, don't have to leave their culture at the door. Now, uh, they've only given me three minutes, and I would like to go into everything that our students have done and how great they are, and we have several in the audience tonight. Um, uh, and I'm happy to see them. Our graduates have gone on to do extraordinary things um, and in a range of places, and we have infiltrated the South Sound region, every healthcare system, every public health department, every, they've started NGOs in their countries, they've nonprofits, and so at this moment, we, they fulfilled our dream for us, but here's the point. It's never been about our dream. When students walk through the door, they develop, they bring their own dreams. And so they've gone on to be successful in their dreams for themselves, for their families, for their communities. And that's what we so are grateful to all you students for. You left a legacy at UWT that we're just trying to keep up with all of you. I have, as one of the things that happens is we get to talk to our alumni all the time. And I'm standing here with my colleague, Vincent Daw, who is an alumni of healthcare leadership. Now, I could go on about Vincent, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then I'm going to let him tell his own story. Vincent was in healthcare leadership, and he was student body president for two years in a row. No other student body president has that. Why was he elected? It was a pandemic. He was elected during the pandemic. He was fearless and fierce about advocating for what students needed during the pandemic, and so they voted him in again. I've had the privilege of working in the community with Vincent um, as well. He works in the Center of Health Equity and Wellness at Multicare, but here's the other thing is that we're trying to move Nourish Pierce County food banks and distribution, the largest in Pierce County, to a food justice model, and the board and staff of, of Nourish have voted Vincent to be the first chair of the community advisory so we can start moving it toward a perfect. 
And so, um, at this moment, I'm going to let Vincent tell you about all the other incredible things that he does. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Stevens, for those kind words. Uh, before I start, I actually want to kind of honor our faculty. So if you're a faculty within the healthcare leadership or nursing, could you please stand up and we'll give you a round of applause. As Dr. Stevens mentioned, the great programs of the healthcare leadership program, I'll talk about kind of the student perspective and the impact it has on me. And I can break it down into your first and second year. I um, mean, two years go by quick, you know, as a student. So as the students here sitting today, enjoy every moment they have in the healthcare leadership classes. So the first year, what they do is really teach you how to have team dynamics. Each class, you're always in group projects. And one thing that I really liked about our group dynamics is in Dr. Lane's class, one memorable moment was we were talking about social disparities and racial biases. And one really uh, great thing is that Dr. Lane would always have us actually have uh, academic discussions. Sometimes they would get heated, but the only way to really create change is to be accountable to each other and really talk about the biases within ourselves in order to really create change in healthcare. We all carry biases. It's really just about acknowledging it and how it affects others. So thank you, Dr. Lang, for all that thing. And the funniest moment in my first year actually goes to Dr. Patsy Malone. Uh, I kid you not, we had to do a presentation. And her challenge was, it was a weird challenge, is that we had to wear a cape and uh, a little kind of like a Batman goggle uh, thing, and we had to present. And one moment that really taught me is that sometimes that are stressful. Some people are very stressed about doing presentations. That one moment really taught me that sometimes when you can laugh or smile, uh, it makes it better. So as healthcare leaders, there's a lot of stressful situations and challenges that arise. So sometimes it's a good reminder to really just smile and have a laugh with it as it goes on. <laughs> And then now, going to our second year, this is where it really is insightful about this program is that your last quarter at the program, you do a practicum. And what Dr. Stevens mentioned about our campus being 68% first-gen, my, like myself, I never really had an experience in the hospital setting. And so I was really grateful for the program to really have that built in. And so in my last quarter, I really got to do an internship at the Department of Health uh, with their health legislative policy team. And I would give advice to students saying that sometimes what you don't like is better because then you can like subtract. So sometimes what you don't like helps you find what you like in healthcare because healthcare is so broad and big. So find your niche um, after that. But the one impactful thing about the healthcare leadership program is that it really prepares the leaders of today. Having big cohorts with 30 to 40 students in it, it really uh, develops a sense of purpose within the mission of helping people improve health equity. Not only that, five or 10 years down the road, we'll create connections. Some of my peers will be directors, senior leaders in these healthcare companies across the community. And not only that, but with healthcare leadership being the more non-clinical side of this, uh, you can forge your own path. People in my peer that graduated in my cohort, some of them are work insurance, IT, health records, anything. So what's really grateful about this program is that you can forge your own path. It is not really a dictated path for you. And last thing I want to really say is uh, I really wish 30 more years of more great extension to this program. So I want to lastly just end with gratitude and thank the faculty, staff, and leadership and our Utah Tacoma leadership as well for creating the leaders of the past, building the leaders of today, and then welcoming the leaders of tomorrow. So thank you. Vincent, and thank you, Dr. Stevens, for inviting us to know it is in one another we find inspiration, and that is the way we continue to grow. 30 more years. I might be in a different position than I am now watching you, but you, you're going to rock that, Vincent. We'll be there for you, okay? We'll celebrate that. I'd like to invite um, now two of our wonderful, um, should we say, colleagues and graduates. It's um, Jerry Ann Babo and Gloria Brigham. Jerry Ann is a, a very important person in the Nursing Commission, and Gloria Brigham, with our w, she's an executive with our WSNA. I think one of the most wonderful things about coming to something like this and realizing the stature of the people you're standing with is that we went to school together. Some <laughs> and so, Vincent, you are right. You are going to be in a community holding hands and being a part of grace and those things. So. Um, 
uh, you guys decided who's coming first? Great. So please join me in welcoming Gloria. Oh, it's you. No. I had the pleasure of going to graduate school with Kathleen, and you can rest assured we had some good times. In fact, I think we got some looks in our uh, master's graduation because we were right next to each other. We weren't really well behaved. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to share my experiences with the UWT nursing program. I am so honored to have all of my academic nursing degrees from the UW nursing program, but especially the education doctorate with an emphasis in nursing education. You know the education from the UWT nursing program is excellent, so I'm going to focus on another area of excellence that may not be as well known, and that area is student support. When the nurses in our EDD cohort started the program, Dr. Sharon Fott gave us a note of welcome, offering support and encouraging persistence. Along with that note was a pack of lifesavers and a bow with W's all over it. <laughs> Here it is. It continues to sit on my desk as a reminder of persistence, kindness, and the strength of support, and the power of community. Dr. Fott created a community of learners for the nurses in the EDD program. She came down to the classroom every Friday that we were on campus to check on us, offering study rooms, asking if we need anything, checking on our progress and, communi and communicated genuine caring for us as individuals. Dr. Fa was not alone in this caring attitude. Dr. Marjorie Doberatz, Katie Adamson, Ruth Ray, and Sandy Perdue made the teaching and learning process a pure joy. Thank you for all of your time, energy, excellence, to bring the EDD practice doctorate to the South Sound. You are very appreciated and valued as nurse educators and leaders. Finally, in 2005 to 2008, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Fodd and other members of the faculty, Dr. Drevdahl, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Doberatz, Dr. Ray, and Dr. Perdue that supported the development of the first RNDBSN in the community college setting in Washington State and the third in the nation. It was a controversial endeavor. Dr. Fott and I spoke about the partnership all over the United States, and there was one common theme that kept coming up. That theme was often expressed in a question or a statement of disbelief how could the nursing program at UW collaborate with a community college? I can answer the question with ease. The UWT nursing program cared about access to nursing education for place-bound students. They cared about the quality of nursing education. They cared about the nursing profession and they cared about supporting positive outcomes for patients. So once again, thank you, UWT Nursing Program, for your vision, your leadership, your caring, and your standard of excellence for nursing education. It has been a highlight of my professional career to have been able to collaborate with you and to grow as a nurse leader and as an individual because of the association with UWT. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to um, have Gloria Brigham, my colleague in the EDD program, come up and speak to you.
Well, uh, what I'd like to do now is to stand up here for my three minutes because Jerry Ann really said it all. Um, she was a wonderful colleague and we had a wonderful time in that EDD program. Um, I'm honored to be here today to celebrate this 30th year milestone and to recognize the excellence right here in our very own backyard. Uh, between about 2006 and 2016, the University of Washington Tacoma was really my home away from home. While working full time, I earned an MN degree and then went on to be part of that inaugural class that we've been talking about in the EDD program. While at the UWT during the same time frame, I was graciously oriented to become adjunct faculty um, and enjoyed that tremendously. Um, the learning experience and the amazing faculty, staff, and colleagues here made a difference beyond belief. There are a couple things I want to highlight about the University of Washington Tacoma. I could go on and on, but you know, three minutes, got two things to talk about. Uh, so the first is the culture of caring and the support for the diverse and individual student needs. Uh, not long into my MN program, I was invited to meet in the nursing office with one of the staff members. So my plan for my MN experience was one class a quarter, summer's off. I was taking the slow train. So called into the office to meet with a nice staff member who was worried about not my academic progression, but my academic pace. So think snail's pace. So this kind person wanted to know how the UW faculty and staff could support me better to ensure that I met my educational outcomes. And really read that bottom line was, the staff member was kindly telling me that she was afraid that this turtle wasn't gonna finish the race. What that told me was first of all that I really appreciated that individualization and the reaching out. Um, but more important, I realized that this UW program was where I wanted to be because everybody on the UW team, staff, faculty, everyone, worked so hard to support student success for uh, the diverse student population and to be equitable and inclusive in all that they did. Oh, as a side note, I did use that uh, tortoise approach and I one class at a time uh, for uh, each quarter and had summers off, so fabulous experience. <laughs> okay, second key point that I'd like to make uh, is related to innovation. You know, every class that I took at the University of Washington had some sort of twist or turn or innovation from a fabulous staff. But beyond classes here that were fabulous was the innovation and in creating that EDD program. It was really amazing to have the nursing program partner with education to welcome professionals from K through 12, higher education and nursing to come together for an EDD program and to learn about educational leadership. But that wasn't all that our program did and Jerry Ann talked a little bit about it, how we had the support of the nursing faculty here at UWT to guide those nurses in the program and to help us take the principles from the EDD program and operationalize them into nursing practice. Fabulous experience, great colleagues, wonderful growth. So the Master of Nursing and the EDD programs here at UW opened many doors to professional opportunity for me personally. First, in uh, care quality and patient safety as the division director of risk management for a large health system. And then later, after the EDD program, uh, as a leader in the professional organization for registered nurses of Washington State, I'm proud to help lead the Washington State Nurses Association. For all of the great experiences and support that uh, all students receive at the University of Washington, I am very grateful um, because without that, I might not have had the wonderful opportunities. Thank you. And we are fortunate to have such leadership in our school and in our shared community. 
Now I get to have the privilege of introducing um, a wonderful keynote speaker, Teresa Brongart. Now you all got to read about her in the invitation. She has a whole table of peeps who are supporting her back there. <laughs> so, we are very honored to have her. When she was one of the earliest class graduations, there she, you will see these, there she is. She is graduating. Look how lovely that is. She's graduating and she went on to, uh, she was an award winner for the Gift of Service Award. She's also been the MN Scholar Award, which she got. Currently she serves as the Senior Vice President of Patient Care, um, at pet, Patient Medical Care Services at Valley, and she is a CNO, a CNO who talked about hope this year. She said one of the hardest things she has is finding hope for the caregivers who do such important work. For someone who studied hope in my PhD studies, I can only say, Teresa, you inspire us. So thank you, and please come forward to share your words. <laughs> Well, I'll just say welcome again um, to all of our distinguished guests, faculty, alumni, friends, and family. And thank you to everyone joining us today to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. I am so honored to be here today to celebrate the faculty, the alumni, and the students of this incredible program, to honor and celebrate the past and look forward to the future. As I stand before you today, I am in awe. Just like the first day I came to class in the summer of 1993, in the Seifers building in Tacoma, the site of the early days of the nursing program. And yes, it was hot. <laughs> um, I was 25 years old, and I had no idea of the journey I'd begun the incredible people I would meet and the relationships that would last 30 years and beyond. I can also hardly believe that 30 years has passed since that day and that I would be standing here to tell my story. It is just one of so many. So to be able to share mine with you today is a great honor because of the many incredible alumni who are working daily to create and support the profession of nursing in our community. It is with deep appreciation and admiration I have for the faculty here. I am so honored to impart what this university has meant to me and still means to me, my career, to so many of my colleagues, some of them are with me today, and of course my family and friends, and the community I am honored to serve. So, my journey to complete my Bachelor of Nursing ended when I found the University of Washington, Tacoma. Working full time and living in the South Puget Sound meant finding a way to, to meet the demands of work and school and navigating the travel time to and from both. Having an extension of the University of Washington literally in my backyard meant I could attend the best nursing school in the country. The innovative curriculum accounted for the working nurse, and the reach of this campus was far greater than just the South Puget Sound. I attended classes with students from Vancouver, Washington, Northern Oregon. It was amazing, the impact. UW Tacoma was exactly what I and so many others needed to be successful, to be able to balance home, children, family, and career with continuing our education. I had just become a new leader in the medical intensive care unit at Harborview Medical Center when I started coursework in the bachelor program. It was exactly what I needed. It helped me to guide my path in nursing leadership. 
The courses focused on the realities of working in a variety of healthcare settings. Tools were provided to help navigate management, quality, population health, and assignments that meant being able to research and write about real problems nurses manage with their patients, their community, and beyond. And there's no lack of content when you're working and going to school because there's all kinds of problems we're always solving. <laughs> These tools, ideas, support, and guidance enabled me to utilize them in real time, enriching the experience and the dialogue that I could have with my faculty and students. And the faculty. I know that you're here some common themes, but they were always available and they were always willing to help and to individualize and to support you however they, however they could. They show every day the deep care they have for all of their students. And that's evidenced by the people here and virtually who are honoring the legacy that they have given us. And then when it came time to make future decisions in my career, where did I want to go? Who did I want to be as a leader? What did I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> Naturally, all these questions led me back here. Inquiry into the master's program at UW Tacoma was like coming home. The experience I had was further enriched by the many faculty who were still here. <laughs> Those familiar faces I had known as a 25-year-old, we're still here. I'm not going to tell you. I think it was 40 <laughs> um, when I came back, and it was awesome. Um, they were here to welcome me, and but there was something that had changed, and that was me. I wanted to do more for nurses. I wanted to do more to help people. I was an experienced leader by that time, and I was ready to immerse myself into a rich learning environment with a new perspective. And it just so happened, I was given the biggest assignment of my career right at the beginning of my master's program. And that was to triple the size of the critical care unit I was managing and transition another one to another leader, but we won't go into that. There's a lot, a lot of change management, a lot of planning, and also, it meant hiring 85 nurses in the next 18 to 24 months. Well, <laughs> in today's world, I can't even imagine doing that. I don't know how we did it then, but we did it. And there's one person here who knows how we did it. <laughs> um, but the most perfect situation presented itself, and I leveraged the integration of school and work. What a better way to learn leadership and research and change management than to live it, all with the help and support of amazing faculty. In the end, I published this work under the inspiring guidance of Dr. Sharon Fott, a mentor, leader, and friend for 30 years. Without the innovation of this school, Many of us would never have been able to balance all of the competing priorities nurses face and may not have gone on to further our education, thus diminishing our opportunities to lead, teach, and guide the vision for nursing. As I've reflected on this day, I think about the thousands of nurses who have graduated from this school, who are out in our community, especially in the South Puget Sound region, serving as leaders in healthcare, in public health, the military, in education, teaching and growing new nurses, acute and post-acute hospitals, health system leaders, and scholars, publishing much needed research to continue to add to the growing and evolving changes in nursing practice. That need has never been so important as it is today the pandemic has witnessed great losses of our nursing colleagues throughout our state and country. The last two and a half years have been beyond anything any of us have ever experienced, especially in the delivery of healthcare. And never 
has it been so important for healthcare leaders to partner with academic institutions. And through education, research, and leadership, bring nurses back and recruit new ones into this most rewarding profession. It is so important for each of us to renew our sense of purpose and create our vision together so we can move forward together. Every single day, I am prepped to be a nurse. And I am grateful. I am even more grateful that I was able to create a deeper relationship with nursing because of the faculty here at the University of Washington, Tacoma. I'm so glad you founded this program <laughs> and that I could be a part of it. They continue, this faculty, to weave the art and science of nursing together. They endeavor to educate, support, and nurture the nursing leaders of the future. So let us celebrate and honor the legacy of this school as we look to the future together with promise and hope. wonderful word to be speaking of legacy and promise in the same sentence. We look back and we look forward. Right now we're going to pause and have Janet Promomo, Professor Emeritus, come forward and talk about Rosa Franklin and the wonderful spiritually inspiring woman Rosa has been in the state of Washington for education and for nursing. Thank you so much for gathering with us this afternoon to celebrate our 30th anniversary. I focus my remarks on Senator Rosa Franklin's inspiring legacy as an extraordinary public servant, community activist, legislator, advocate for nursing education and all education, social justice and health, and registered nurses, and how that has led us to the creation of an endowed scholarship in her name. I first met Senator Franklin 30 years ago, you can tell from the pictures that have been shown, a while ago, and as one of those founding faculty members, launching a new pr program was really a dream come true for me. This program for registered nurses who were wanted to pursue their BSN was really quite a dream come true, really. I had the flexibility to create new courses for adult learners. In the winter of 93, I offered a one credit or two credit elective course on health policy and politics. politics. That was something near and dear to my heart. And that elective was one that included my favorite teaching modality, experiential learning, which meant we took a field trip to, to, to the Olympia State Capitol for Washington State Nursing Association's Legislative Day. The highlight certainly was meeting with Senator Rosa Franklin in her office, the very first African American senator in our state, not just the first woman. Remembering back to 92, 93, if you, re if you were born then, that was really a time that women advanced in public office. So it was a very exciting time. So we got to meet with Senator Franklin and learn about her nursing background and how that gave her special perspective about championing for social justice, education, and health. She saw firsthand as a nurse how the health system could be improved. Next slide, please. So this is this iconic slide. Okay, well, it'll come. Um, I invited her to speak at our very first nursing week celebration in that Perkins building that Sharon referred to. So May 93, I was afraid she can't come because this, the, the Washington State's Healthcare Reform Act had just been passed, which was later rescinded. So I had to get up 
dressed up in a Tacoma general cape because I thought if I have to be the main act, I better do something fun. <laughs> so uh, we had a, a terrific time with Senator Franklin. In 1993, she was also a speaker at our first graduation celebration. And she was a guest in our leadership classes talking about health policy for many years. And whenever I took students to Olympia for legislative day, we always met with Senator Franklin. Next slide, please. She was always one to encourage nurses to become involved in their, in their political, in, in advocacy. And she said, I quote, um, I continue stressing to nurses the importance of moving forward in their own agenda and speaking out as needed. I'm gonna paraphrase that, but um, you know, let's see. Uh, Senator Franklin really wanted nurses to take more responsibility and she inspired so many of us to become more active, including former Representative Don Morell, who ran for political office, was one of our BSN graduates and took my health policy course. I said, come to me and I'm gonna open my checkbook and support you. For 30 years, I collected information about Senator Rosa Franklin and that allowed us to support the biography of Senator Franklin that was published just at the beginning of the pandemic. Next slide, please. This book is available on order from the Washington State Legislative Gift Center. So I treasure my correspondence. I have many handwritten notes from Senator Franklin and those from her uh, typed up by her staff. To recognize the contributions and the impact of Senator Franklin, not only on our nursing program, but really on, I think, our curriculum as well, we launched the Senator Franklin in, uh, Nursing Scholarship way back in 93. And just last year, we officially launched an endowment so that that permanent fund would help sustain her legacy. So I hope you'll consider contributing to the Senator Rosa Franklin Endowment Fund. And on the table, there are cards that you can take home, and this course can be done online. But I am thrilled to be here to celebrate with you all today and to recognize the founding a philosophy of a very, very inspiring woman, Senator Rosa Franklin. Thank you. It's very exciting to see social justice lived from 1993. Some of you weren't even born yet, right, Vincent? <laughs> we can celebrate the grace of what that means to us, that justice, political action, and the opportunity to be called into true excitement of this is where we are. We have spent some wonderful time with Janet now sharing the legacy of Rosa Franklin, the legacy of 30 years, Teresa's idea of how hope can be integrated, and so wonderful that a senior leader in a CNO vice president can still speak of hope. That's one of the things we all need to find, what it is that we are called next to be in the hopefulness. One of the things we have that we have been very fortunate is young, vital faculty who are doing some very exciting research. I'm going to have us watch Two recorded, Wei Chao, who is traveling in Asia, as well as Sunny, who couldn't be with us, but they wanted to share their research. So these are moments of where we're looking to. We have spent time looking back, but what are we looking forward to? So if you can go ahead with that, and then we'll have, I'll call forward two faculty to speak. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Wei Chao Yuwen, an assistant professor at the school. My scholarship focuses on examining the interplay of culture and health and developing interventions to promote health among historically oppressed individuals and families. I have developed two technology enabled health solutions of tailored symptom self and family management support in people with chronic health conditions and their families. I have worked with cross culture populations and communities, including black, Latino, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Over time, I have centered my research around promoting health equity and have found that family caregivers are a underserved population in critical need of support. 
especially those who are from diverse backgrounds and prefer to speak a language other than English. I'm working with collaborators from biomedical informatics, public health, computer science, and human-centered design and engineering in developing COCO for care, caring for caregivers online. COCO is a cutting edge technological solution for family caregivers using artificial intelligence and natural language processing. We hope to make COCO available in different languages and sensitive to different cultures in the future to support family caregivers from diverse backgrounds. Thank you everyone for attending this wonderful celebration. Hello, my name is Sunny Chen. I joined the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership in 2017. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share my program of research, which I see as a blueprint that brings hope to patients with mental illness and their family caregivers. I'm passionate about mental health because this spectrum, uh, everyone will move back and forth along this line in their entire life. My research emphasized the continuum from supporting the recovery from mental illness to the prevention of mental disorders and promotion of mental wellness. About 450 million people today suffer from mental disorders. 30 years ago, we placed people in the lock in psychiatric institutions, while today we value recovery in the community a lot. One of the pro projects uh, I'm working on is to work with uh, community mental health network called New Journeys in Washington state to establish a nurse care manager role to support the physical and mental health care for patients suffer from mental illness. Prevention is better than treatment. This prevention model worked really well for medical disorders which have clear etiology. However, mental illness is very complicated. It's even challenging to agree on the exact timing for disease onset. Therefore, I interview patients with mental illness to identify what would be the early warning signs that we can use for the, uh, identify people who are at risk of mental illness. After mapping up uh, those indicators, I work with computer science experts using machine learning model to optimize the early identification process. In October 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a national emergency in children's mental health, citing the serious toll of the COVID-19 pandemic on top of existing challenges. I work with Tacoma Public Schools, MultiCare, and Tacoma Pierce County Health Department to provide resources and support to school personnel to know how to support children with behavioral health issues. In addition, we provide mental health literacy training to students in order for them to know how to seek help when they sense something is going wrong within them and with their peers. There have been a lot of challenges and changes over the past 30 years. There will be more ahead, but I know together we walk far. Thank you. So I would like to invite um, to the stage um, both Katie um, Herling and uh, Sharon Lang. It's so wonderful as we hear Sunny and Wei Chao speaking about what it means to care for caregivers, natural language processing and machine learning, and really promoting all around health. It's a great horizon. So um, Katie, would you like to come forward? Well, thank you everyone for being here and thank you to Kathleen and the staff and everybody who put this together. Um, and thank you for inviting me to say a few words. I understand there are other events going on in the world. If you need to check the score, that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm really honored just to be able to share a few words with you all today. Um, like Kathleen said, I am uh, Katie Hurling and I'm um, faculty here in the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. Today, we are celebrating 30 years, honoring the past and shaping the future. And as we've heard today, we have a lot to celebrate. As I was reflecting about what to say today, I remembered a spring day um, more than a few years ago when Dr. Sharon Fott called me 
and offered me a position as an assistant professor in what, at that time, was the nursing and healthcare leadership program at the University of Washington Tacoma. And that day, I was also celebrating my 30th birthday. <laughs> um, and that call gave me one more thing to celebrate. Looking back now, I can see how young I was um, when I received that call, but I felt old. And I felt old in a good way. Um, I'd recently earned my PhD, and I really saw taking on this tenure track faculty position, which was my dream, um, as a pinnacle experience, an accomplishment that I should savor, um, a superlative, a high point, and kind of the summit of a mountaintop experience. And it was, um, but it was also the starting point of so much that I had ahead of me. And today, we are celebrating our 30th birthday. Um, we, our school, the University of Washington School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership that we are all connected to in some way is 30 years old. This is an accomplishment to savor, a superlative, a high point on a mountain. Um, and it is a moment to imagine and plan for what we have ahead of us. Right now, we might feel old in a good way, um, but 10 or 20 or 50 years from now, we'll look back on this moment as part of our young adulthood. We have so much left ahead of us that we need to accomplish. We have a grand mission, and I um, kind of personalized our, our mission statement, to provide undergraduate and graduate education for diverse citizens of the South Puget Sound region. We support the interdisciplinary mission of our campus through teaching and scholarly inquiry. Within that mission, we focus on the discovery and dissemination of knowledge that promotes health within an ethic of social justice. Our curriculum emphasizes and fosters the integration of teaching, inquiry, and service through a community of learners. Partnerships with the community assist our school in providing learning environments in which learners build upon their skills and knowledge to strengthen their understanding of local, national, and global health issues. My personal research mission is to help identify the most effective and efficient ways to prepare the next generation of healthcare professionals and to contribute to the evidence base supporting better healthcare education. I believe improving healthcare providers' education will support improved healthcare and a healthier nation and world. So this is the heart of what I and what we do at the University of Washington School of Healthcare Leadership. And everything I do really circulates around these missions. I am just completing a two-year grant from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Center for Regulatory Excellence, informing evidence-based regulation of the use of simulation in nursing education, and embarking on a new interdisciplinary collaborative project um, aimed at engaging learners with high quality, experiential, virtual learning opportunities to prepare them to provide community-based mental health care. And I am so honored to be part of the University of Washington Tacoma School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. We have a shared investment, we have a shared vision, um, and we have important work to do. We're just 30. <laughs> Um, and I'm really excited to see you all here celebrating our past and shaping our future. So thank you um, for being here. And I, shall I introduce Sharon or? Okay. Um, and one of my colleagues is also um, going to be talking about this section about kind of looking, looking forward. So Sharon Lang. Well, um, it's quite difficult for me to follow the folks that went ahead of me, but I'll certainly do my best to do that. I'm Sharon Lang, and I'm an associate professor here in the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. And my talk today, we really talk about my research, which really focuses substantially on social justice, equity, and inclusion. And then move on to the future of research, research with our students, and, and where do we see ourselves going? We must consider the future of healthcare for vulnerable communities and the role of technology to support healthcare delivery and healthcare outcomes for these communities. Now, where are we with digital healthcare for vulnerable communities? Well, we see through the pandemic 
that we've been using a lot of digital healthcare management from teleconferencing to um, digital um, technology to mobile apps to a number of different things. Um, and these technologies and tools are designed to expand patient access to services. And this is important. Certainly we must target vulnerable communities. Now my study in 2016, quite a while back, was designed to look at how low resource communities are using these tools. Uh, we know that um, these tools, smartphones and all the, the other devices are used by higher um, level communities. But um, the idea was that well, low folks, low resource folks, low, low income folks are not using these devices. They are. And our research found that majorities of safety net patients, so we weren't really just looking at low resource communities. We're targeting safety net patients who are truly engaged in digital healthcare management. We had majorities up to 75% were using uh, mobile phones to support their health and wellness. We had respondents who were doing this weekly. But we found that the age of the respondents and their income remain a significant barrier to engagement. We also went on to work with healthcare providers to find out, well, how can we support them to engage their um, patients in digital healthcare management? What type of tools and supports do they need to engage their patients? And they told us that, you know, let's consider coming up with a clinical practice guide that allows us to work directly with patients, that allows us to understand, to put into practice the specific needs of these patients, that is these social determinants of health factors that we talked about, and how do we, do they, do we link them to these things? So they told us that they really do need a standardized model to do this work. So we understood that there's some work that needed to be done to support low resource communities. But where do we stand in terms of the available, available tools to support these communities? Well, um, and I'm, I was so thrilled to hear my colleague, um, Dr. Yuen, speak about what she's doing in terms of tailoring. A recent study was looking at the usability of existing mobile health applications for diabetes, depression, and caregiving. Now, through direct observations and interviewing, the study found that these commercially available apps, applications that we all may take for granted to address diabetes, to address disease, to assure um, we have the proper caregiving support, were not usable by the low resource communities. The reason why was that these folks had a tough time entering their data. They had a tough time entering their blood glucose level. They had a tough time tracking that. So although we have a community that is really invested in using the available tools to support their health and wellness, the problem is, is that the way the tools are designed are not designed specifically for them in order for them to really truly meet their healthcare needs. So we recognize that in the work that we do, we must tailor these tools because the folks that are most impacted by chronic disease is, are the folks that I'm working with folks in these safety net communities. We must go to these communities, we must talk to these people, we must learn their needs, and we must tailor and design the, the tools so that it can be feasible and usable for these communities. So, the implication is that technologists must involve low resource safety net communities and their healthcare providers in their study when they're trying to develop these tools to support these communities. How do we move this needle forward? Well, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a research study um, supported by the National Institute of Health to support low resource African American girls around healthy eating and physical activity. We're working with researchers from Minnesota and Georgia, MIT, but the goal really is to talk to the families, talk to the young women, observe them in their setting, understand what are required in order to fully engage them in physical activity, to fully engage them in healthy eating. This is what we must do. We must truly engage our communities. We're in the phase one, we're wrapping up the phase one feasibility stage, where we're getting really good feedback from our focus group analyses about how to work with vulnerable communities. To wrap this piece up, I'd like to um, say that as we proceed in applying, digital healthcare management to reduce healthcare disparities, 
we must work directly with our communities. And we must work with our communities that are most impacted. We must tailor the tools so that they're developed in a way that reduce frustration in engagement, increase confidence in engagement, and permit the tools to be useful for those communities. The last thing I do want to talk about is training our future healthcare leaders. We must actively engage students in research. Um, evidence show us that such engagement promotes personal as well as academic success. So I'm gonna brag a little bit, if you may indulge me, with some of my students and their successes to show you the, the implication of engaging our students in research. Jamie Root, Maya Nguyen, Bachelor of Arts Healthcare Leadership in 2019, working with me on a subset of the study, they assess the role of affordability, availability, acceptability in ensuring healthcare access to safety net low resource communities. In doing this work, Maya received the Mary Gates Scholar Award. Jamie will be, is a co-author on a paper that we just published in the Journal of Young Investigators. Anna Howard, another student with whom I worked, graduate 2019, her work evaluated the care provided for transgender patients who are using the safety net system. The goal of that study was to support the healthcare providers in really pro providing gender affirming care to transgender community. For her work, Anna won the Mary Gay Scholar Award and she's the lead author of this paper that we just published in the Journal of Young Investigators. She just finished up her MPH in epidemiology in the School of Public Health and she's now pursuing her PhD in epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Lucas Bajorkine, who worked with me several years back, looked at healthy eating and physical activity for rural communities and how can we use digital healthcare to support this community. For his effort, Lucas won the Population Health Recognition Award in 2021. He's co-author on this paper that we submitted and he's currently um, was appointed to work on this research at the UW um, Medical School with a very um, prominent research group. Jackie Madhava, who recently worked with me looking at the impact of COVID on BIPOC communities. Jackie is from Zimbabwe. She was looking at the African community in particular. She explored the ways by which COVID-19 exacerbated social determinants of health factors for African communities in County, in King County, Washington. For her efforts, she won the Mary Gates Scholar Award and she was recently um, afforded the position as executive assistant to the CEO of Washington Association for Community Health Centers. Bao Nguyen, who recently worked with me again, evaluated the impact of COVID on the mental health of Asian American and Pacific Islanders in Washington State and Massachusetts. For her work, she has an abstract that's accepted that will be presented this fall at the American Public Health Association and the Washington State Public Health Association. She will be pursuing Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine in the fall. In the fall. Participating in collaborative research does yield substantial academic achievements. It motivates students to stay focused. It helps develop problem-solving skills. It builds and enforces professional identity, boosts interest in graduate school and professional studies, improves confidence, and improves retention rate. As we look to the next 30 years and beyond, we should continue to emphasize student success through the work that we do as faculty with our students. Thank you. So that is so wonderful that Sharon invites us into how can we bring our students into the glorious and sometimes tiring work of research that improves outcomes and brings equity and justice forward. We have a really important closure to this evening, and 
uh, Dr. David Reyes, who I also went to nursing school with. I mean, I'm so old, I went to school with everybody, right? <laughs> or I taught you, right, Vincent? So um, Dr. Reyes is going to uh, lead from here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, as Kathleen reminded me, we were both undergrads um, more than 30 years ago. Um, so we've heard some amazing stories today, and uh, I know we're nearly to the end of today's celebration, but before we finish, I'd like to offer a few other words, which is first, it's been a great day, uh, and we've heard the reflections and the stories of many of our alumni, our faculty, uh, staff, um, and it's truly a, a cause for celebration. Uh, amazing things happen, and as we think about our past, to think about how we've gotten to this state today, really is a, a cause for celebration. It's clear to me that the values and the principles our school was founded upon then are as relevant today as they were 30 years ago. Our mission of educating our students as ethical leaders, regardless of their professional role, and to act with justice to improve health for all community still rings true. This, however, would not have been possible without the foresight and the stewardship of our school's founders, some who are here today. And so I would like to personally thank them, and if we all give them a, a round of applause. I would also like to take this opportunity for a special recognition um, and share some words. Um, our chancellor, uh, uh, Chancellor um, Sheila Edwards Lang was going to be here today, but as uh, we know, the pandemic is still going around and she is working remotely. But we do have a recorded message from her, so if we could go ahead and watch that. Hmm? I'm, after. Yeah. I'm Sheila Edwards Lang, the UWT Chancellor. I'm so sorry I cannot be there with you due to personal illness. I was so looking forward to celebrating this incredible milestone in our history. For those founding faculty members who are there today, I wanna to extend a special thank you for setting the foundation of excellence that we continue to enjoy today. When I started meeting with members of the community, when I became the UW Chancellor, it was immediately clear the impact that the school has had on Tacoma, the South Sound and the wider region. We have 1,900 living undergraduate alumni, 580 graduate alumni. And I tell you, alumni of this school show up in healthcare leadership positions everywhere I turn in this region. This anniversary celebrates the history of nursing and healthcare leadership, but also so much more. It's 30 years of partnership and relationship building. It's 30 years of constant, steady advocacy for public health, for the vital role of nursing in a sustainable, equitable healthcare industry. The work of all of you and many others has already brought forward so many important results. And that work has laid an incredibly strong foundation for the future. The school and UWT are engaged in vital efforts to expand access to nursing as a profession and to address potentially devastating labor shortages in the healthcare sector. UWT has partnered with other organizations to form the Healthcare Careers Academy. We've also partnered with the Pierce County Healthcare Workforce Coalition to press for funding to address expanding capacity, expanding career pathways at the K-12 level, and creating pathways for upskilling unemployed and underemployed healthcare workers. Another reason to celebrate the 30th anniversary the excellence of the UWT nursing and healthcare leadership has been recognized nationally. In 2022, US News and World Report ranked our program as the number one public master's nursing program in the country. Nursing on Tacoma, Seattle, and Bothell campuses are accredited as one UW School of Nursing, but this ranking is entirely due to the great work of UW Tacoma and Bothell, as Seattle does not have a master's degree. So congratulations to all of you on this 30th anniversary and for incredible work done thus far. And now for a very special, exciting surprise, the UWT School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership has created a new Founders Legacy Award 
to recognize outstanding leadership and contributions to the school. And I am thrilled beyond words to announce that the inaugural recipient of this award is Sharon Gavin Thought. Sharon is the most modest leader in higher education I have ever met. The secret to her success has been her insistence that she remain behind the scenes and that others deserve to be in the spotlight. Her entire career has been dedicated to the professionalization of nursing and healthcare leadership. She's had an enormous impact on this school, having led it for 20 of its 30 years of existence. She was there at the beginning, and she has been there for every major milestone in the history of the program, including serving as the inaugural dean when it was elevated to a school. Put together her modesty, her strategic outlook, her dedication to nursing, and what she has done for the school and the university, she is more than worthy as the recipient of this inaugural Founders Legacy Award. Please join me in congratulating Sharon and welcoming her to the microphone. She just called me sneaky. Well, first of all, I'm terribly surprised, and I think all of these guys have Sneaky as their middle name, right, David? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. As many of you know, I miss work terribly, and I really welcome any opportunity to support the work of the school in nursing and healthcare leadership and in academic programs yet to come. So th uh, thank you does not seem quite enough, but it's all I have. I'm quite surprised. Thank you very much. And before she actually, we have one more little accolade we'll uh, play for right now, someone who also couldn't be here, Dr. Ali Madaris. Sharon, I'm so sorry for not being there during your festivities, but you know where I am. And I think you approve of the trip I'm taking to go see my parents. So sorry for not being there, but I thought I should share a few things with you I really appreciate you. You have been the sort of leader I have always followed. From the first day I came to campus, I have been able to work with you and learn from you. You are a founding dean for me. You are the sort of person who built this campus. And I have to say that I was very surprised very early on when I found your signature on the formation of School of Urban Studies. So in many ways, the position I have is owed to you and your signature as well. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and sharing your experience with all of us. I, I do miss working with you. I hope all is well with you and you're enjoying retirement. And in many ways, I'm looking forward, forward to interacting with you when I return, maybe have coffee, maybe have a chat. You will be always someone who I want to have on speed dial. Thanks again for many years of camaraderie on the Council of Deans, for many years of interacting with me. You made it so personal. You, you learned about my family, and every time I saw you, you asked about them. I truly appreciate your genuine interest and how you treat your fellow um, deans and how you interact with all of us and faculty and staff. You are a true leader. I wish you the best. I hope you enjoy this surprise, and you will forgive me for not being there. I look forward to seeing you when I return. Thank you, and be well. Congratulations again, Sharon. So, and now, just before we close, again, thank you, Sharon, for your leadership. Uh, big shoes to fill, uh, even if it's in the interim. Uh, because of you and so many others, our School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership is poised for the next chapter uh, in our future, a future built upon the foundational leadership you and others uh, have cultivated. And so, as we move forward into the future, we envision a school that advances justice and inclusion among our staff, students, faculty, that engages in equitable relationship and partnership with each other and in the community, 
strives for edu educational um, excellence uh, and student success, that is innovative and accessible and celebrates the expertise, scholarship, and success of our entire school. This would not be possible without the foundational values and principles that you all have laid down for us. Lastly, before we close, I want to recognize and thank the planning team, and I'd like to ask both Jessica and Dr. Kathleen Sand to please stand. These two are the stalwarts, so thank you again. And thanks to each and one of you for being here today to celebrate, to honor our past, and I invite you to be part of our future. Thank you, and have a good evening, and have cupcakes. <laughs> thank you again.